Welcome to Mike Morrison Ministries Church at the Barn, Tuesday night Bible study. So would you uh, open your Bibles tonight, please, to Mark chapter 16 and also Matthew um, chapter 28. We'll read Matthew first and then Mark. If you've got a red letter Bible, you'll notice Jesus starts talking in Mark, in Matthew 28, 18. I'll just read the narrative to get there. Verse 16, then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power, that's what I want you to see. Every bit of authority, that power there is talking about. He's the boss of everything. Go you, therefore. Go ye means you go. And you teach all nations. You baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. You teach, you teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have taught you or commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Now, go to Mark 16 and pick up in verse 14. You see the same account the way Mark saw it. We just heard it the way Matthew wrote it down. He was there. He was one of those 11. Mark was also one of those 11. And this is what he got out of it. Afterward, he appeared unto the 11 as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief. I like to point that out every time because religion has made this... Um, these last words Jesus said in Mark, very soft and, and uh, lovely and sort of timid the way they do these movies and things. Jesus is uh, chewing them out. Upbraiding means he's ripping them. It's time that they do what he told them to do. And he's, it, it's time they quit messing around, lending mental assent to what he's told them to do, and they start doing it. I believe Jesus needs, is in the process right now, the Holy Spirit, of upbraiding some of the body of Christ and saying, hey, quit playing church. There's more to do during the course of the week than to get beat up and then come to church to get patched up so you can go back and get beat up some more. That's not what God has in mind for the body of Christ. He expects us to rule and reign, walk in victory and triumph over every situation that comes up all the time. Victorious, glorious church. We'll, we'll look at some of that in a minute. Uh, now let's turn please to Colossians chapter one. And I want to pray this prayer that we find here, Colossians chapter 1. I'll start reading in verse 9. And I'll just tell you before we pray, we're about to take a look at a... We're about to go back to... A, I guess you lost your place, so it's easy to find. We're going back to the commission in a minute. We're about to look at, uh, at what Jesus has told the body of Christ to do, what he expects the body of Christ to do. And right now in 2022, before 23 gets here, he expects people to start doing what he told them, people in the church to start doing what he told the church to do and quit ignoring it like it's not in the Bible. And uh, we'll see in a minute what that's talking about. But let's pray first. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, 
do not cease to pray for you and to desire that. So this is what he prayed without ceasing for the, not just this church uh, in this city, but, f but for the churches that he set up everywhere. There are several of these prayers in the New Testament. And when you find them, they're anointed. I mean, they're, they're in the anointed word of God. You can use them for an outline and pray the same idea over and over again and over again. How many of you know it's not vain repetition to repeat a prayer? What's vain repetition is to repeat a prayer without thinking about or believing what you're praying. That's vain repetition. But, but to, to pray something that, uh, that needs activated, and something like this needs activated every once in a while. Why? Because you get busy in life and get things unactivated. What's activated mean? It means you know it's in the Bible and you're releasing your faith and believing you receive it and you've got your faith there out on it, expecting it to come to pass. Now it's active. When did your faith get on it? When you prayed it. And if you forget about it, you can pray it again and get it active again. Keep it active. All right, so this is starts right there let's uh, let's verse uh, i'll switch over to the amplified bible and read verse 9 for this reason we also from the day we heard it have not ceased to pray and make special requests for you and asking this is what they're asking so we could pray it like this you can Pray it different every time, but the idea of it is what I'm looking for here. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that, that people studying with us right now will, uh, will be filled with the full, deep, clear knowledge of your will, Lord, in all spiritual wisdom, in comprehensive insight into your ways and purposes. And I pray and we believe we receive understanding and discernment of spiritual things. I thank you for showing us not only what you said, but what you meant when you said it about things that are happening in the invisible spiritual world. And Father, we pray to be invigorated and strengthened with all power according to the might of your glory, to exercise every kind of endurance, every kind of patience, every kind of perseverance, every kind of forbearance with joy. Thank you for that power. We thank you, Father. You've qualified and made us fit to share, share the portion which is our inheritance as your holy people, saints and light, restored to your original plan, saints. Hallelujah. Father, you have delivered and drawn us to yourself and you've, you've taken us out of the control and the dominion of darkness, and you have transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of your love. We are seated together with you in heavenly places. We're on the ark, hallelujah, in it. And from your perspective, looking down on what's going on in this world, from your perspective, we have all the resources of heaven, the tactical advantage, all the supernatural weapons you've given us at our disposal to use as you direct, where you direct, when you direct, how you direct. And I thank you that when we do pay attention to you and we put our, we put our faith out expecting you to use us in this 21st century, 2022, that we, we have the privilege then of being involved in your changing dark to light, wrong to right, everything 
for that's cursed to blessed. Amen. I thank you, Father, for a supernatural transformation, particularly because we're here on the high plains of the United States. I'm praying for a, I'm praying for a, a supernatural transformation from dark to light on these high plains from the top of Canada all the way to Texas. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you that your light is shining and driving out the darkness. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we're, we, our faith is out there in this prayer, and so God is right now going to, as we look at and talk about things that we've looked at and talked about our whole Christian life ever since we've been in the Word, God's going to re-fire things we already know, but there'll be revelation in things that we think we already know and we'll see, hey, never saw it quite that way before. And then if we take enough time in the next few weeks to look at some of this stuff more than once, that's, that's when you know that you've come out of diapers, you've come out of Sunday school, and you've got up into the army of God. When you can take something God said and look at it over and over and over and over, expecting every time to get more out of it than you had the time before. That's what God meant by faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. Every time you hear it, faith comes, grows, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and God said, the just shall live by faith. So faith in what God said that he's given you to say. And when you take something, God's faith is in it already. And you activate it with your mouth, putting your faith in it with God's faith in it, then you have complied with his instruction as a warrior in the army of God, and you, you, you fired that weapon. You launched that rocket into this realm with the words. And those words are full of the power of God to bring what he had you say to pass. The power is in those words to bring invisible promises of God to manifestation, physical manifestation in the earth, and that's the glory of God. When God's promise becomes real, that's the glory of God. And you and I are here and authorized, deputized, empowered by God to use this method to get, to get right righteousness right, to get dunamis power and glory, to get the anointing of God and the blessing of God into any situation that needs to turn around from wrong to right. That's what we do. And with God back in the words that we say, we will triumph every single time. So let's take the time now. It's a Bible study. I don't know how far we'll get, but it'll, it'll be good. And look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Or 2nd, excuse me, 2nd Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Example 1 that you're very, very familiar with. We even read it once in a while. We're going to read it again. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Always translate that out of Greek into English. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's not his title. It's the anointed. He is the anointed one. You are a, an anointed one. You're a Christian. And Christ, the Christ, is Jesus 
But if you're talking about the anointed one, you've got to be talking about what he's anointed with. And he told everybody what it was. It's the Holy Spirit of God. He says, as a matter of fact, Jesus said when he walked in the earth, it's not me. I laid that down. I came here as a man. But the Spirit of God was in me, is in me. And it's the Spirit of God doing this stuff, not me. And when I go, he'll be in you, and you'll do what I've been doing. Hallelujah. That's what Christianity is all about. All right, so here we go. Thanks be to God who in Christ, in the anointing, in that anointing, he always causes us to triumph and makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Read the Amplified Bible there. And through us spreads and makes evidence the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere. How many of you know that's not the religion of Christianism, Christianism he's talking about there? The fragrance of the knowledge of God goes something like this. Hey, God made this place perfect. He made Adam and Eve perfect. They goofed it up. It took God a while to fix it because he turned it all over to them. But Jesus got in here. God the Father got Jesus in the earth. Jesus fixed it. He went to hell, paid the price, came back to life, triumphed over the enemy. And now he set us here with his authority to keep that outlaw under our feet. And whenever he's troubling people, our job is to cast him out. Okay, back to Mark now. <laughs> Mark chapter 16. Okay, so he's, he's, getting, he's getting their attention here in verse 15. You go into all the world and preach, which means proclaim. The gospel, which means good news. Proclaim the good news to every creature. Now that means some of them aren't going to like it. Some of them aren't going to want to hear it. He didn't tell you to pick and choose who you're preaching to. He just said preach. <laughs> well, they're preaching to me. I don't want them to think I'm preaching to them. Well, you're evidently more worried about what they think than you are what your commander-in-chief thinks. Because he said preach. Actually, if you read the New Testament, looking at the word preach, you'll find out he told you to preach it in season and out. That means you preach it when they like it and you preach it when they don't. What? Well, I'm not very comfortable with that. He is talking about a warrior's comfort. How many of you know when you're in an army, the commander-in-chief of that army isn't all that interested in your comfort? He's interested in you wiping out the enemy. Like Patton said, you, he, you don't want a war by dying for your country. You want a war by making the other guy die for his country, and we're here to kill people. Well, he didn't. That's basically what he meant. We're here to kill the enemy. Church, God put us in the earth not to mess around with these devils, but to cast them out and to keep them under our feet. All the time. A continual, total victory. All the time. Not when a few lose a few. Don't wonder, well, why isn't this working? How many of you have ever had that cross your mind? Don't, don't raise your hand. Why isn't this working? It's working! God said, it, God said it'll work every time. Who's right? Your, the thoughts in your head and you're figuring it out? Or what Almighty God said? A better question would be, this has taken a while. I wonder why it's taken so long. But don't say it's not working. 
It's working. As a matter of fact, it worked when you prayed it. When you pray, believe you receive, is what the Bible taught us in Mark uh, 4. It's not right. Mark 11. When you pray, believe you receive it and you have it. Not when you get it in the natural. When you pray, it's invisible first. And when you pray, you get it. Now, it will manifest. And the timing's really not your business. Do you see anywhere in here where God said in the timing you will take care of? You know, if you can't find something in the Bible that God told you to do, you might as well just not do it because he anointed what he told you to do. And when you make up things that you think is a really good thing for you to be doing for God, <clears throat> it's probably not going to work very well. And if it's not working very well, it could be because it's not anointed. But everything he told you to do is anointed. Everything he told you not to do can, will get you in trouble. The only reason he said don't do it, it's not so you don't have any fun, it's so that you don't get in trouble and you're able to fight. Don't do that. Do this. This is where the blessing's at. Walk in a blessing and pray for these people that aren't. Okay. Mark 16 again. And we got to the good part. Verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Remember, there's three baptisms in the New Testament. Baptism of Christ or the new birth is what this one's talking about. It's not talking about water baptism here. You don't have to be water baptized to be born again. People have read this in English Bible not understanding that there are three New Testament baptisms. There's four baptisms mentioned in the Gospels. Only three of them are New Testament. The baptism of John was Old Testament for Old Testament saints to get ready for the new one. The baptism of Christ is when you receive Jesus as Lord. Say, Jesus is Lord, like Saul did on the road to Damascus. Lord! And when you do, you're baptized in Christ. New birth. Reborn. Regenerated. New creature in Christ Jesus. Old things passed away. All things become new. And you're full of Almighty God, the Holy Spirit. If you never did another thing, you're a vessel of the Holy Spirit. And then as you find out about it, you'll find out, well, there's another baptism. You can get water baptized. And if you find out what that's for, you can believe God for what he said water baptism is for. And you go under the water, you'll get that. And then you find out there's a baptism of the Holy Ghost. When you find out what that is and what that's for, and if you want in on that and you follow his directions, that means the spirit on the inside of you will come up through and up on and all over you. In fact, it'll come flowing up out of there and it'll get on things, people, things and animals and plants and everything else that you're coming in contact with. It's the supernatural creative power of God coming up out of there and affecting everything you get around. Amen. If you know about it, you have faith in it and you're walking in it. And you can pull it up there anytime you want to by praying in a language that God, that, that nobody understands. Nobody understands because it's a God language. It's not the gift of tongues coming from God through you to people. This is prayer language coming from the Spirit of God to you so you can say it through Jesus to the Father. And while you're doing that, it's edifying you, it's, which means it's building up, energizing, turning you into a dynamo. Uh, it's, it's taking the power of God that's in there and getting it up on you where you can do something creative with it. Amen. Or I should say it this way, where God can do something creative with it through you as you do what he tells you to do. As you walk where he tells you to walk, say what he tells you to say, 
Touch what he tells you to touch. Bless what he tells you to bless. And if he tells you to curse something, curse it. But don't curse things he didn't tell you to. Because with that power dialed up there, he needs you to listen and do what he says. Not what you want, not what you think, but what he knows and what he says. What you know down in here. Well, I just think God's saying this, but that's not where God's talking. There's a lot of voices have access to your head, and you can't trust them. Some of them will disguise herself as an angel of light. They'll mix you up good. The, the enemy is supposed to be under our feet, not entertained in our head. When he gets in our head, we're supposed to take that thought captive and get it out of there. Amen. How do you know when the devil's talking in your head? It's not Bible. It's not truth. It's got a little twist in there someplace. And if you're wondering if, if that's true or not, ask God. You don't even have to ask God out loud so the devil knows what you're doing. You can just start praying in tongues and ask him and he'll tell you. I'm telling you what, the devil has worked, I think, I think sometimes he's at the point of exhaustion, keeping Christians away from tongues, because he can't handle it. It's your supernatural pipeline to everything God's put on the inside of you, and you can get information from God, and the devil can't understand a word of it. You're short-circuiting him out of everything. When you pray in the natural, he can hear everything you're praying, which is all right. You're praying in the name of Jesus. He can't stop it. But, but, but what's tearing him up is when you're praying in tongues, he can't even understand what you're praying. He doesn't even know what to look out for. That's what I call a weapon he can't deal with. He can't deal with supernatural. The 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14 says that the, there's no temptation taking you. It's not common to man. The devil has to work with what everybody can work with. Not the Christian, Christian. Because the anointing power of God has put things on the inside of you that are not natural. They're supernatural. They're, they're put in there for the pulling down of strongholds. Which means, what's strongholds? Something the devil set up. Yank it down. Tearing up evil things in the invisible. Freeze people down here in the natural where you can see them. Should I go there now? So let's, we're going to get there. I'm getting a little bit, a little bit too big a hurry. Um, back to verse 17. Read 16 one more time. He that is baptized, he, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. When you preach to somebody and they don't believe it, there's, you did what God told you to do. He didn't tell you to receive it for them. He just said, preach it. If they believe it, they'll get it. If they don't, they won't. But you preach it, whether they want to hear it or not. You preach it. And in verse 17, and when you do that, these signs shall follow them that believe. It didn't say the preacher, the the fivefold ministry. It didn't say people with a special gift. It said, you preach, which means you proclaim to people the good news. And when you do, these signs will follow. If you're the one preaching, you got to be the one believing. So these signs will follow you. First one, in my name they shall cast out devils. And that's just the way it is. 
They shall speak with new tongues. That's just the way it is. Well, you know, God gives that to some people and some people he doesn't. No, that's not what the Bible says. That's what human beings have deduced with their intellectual thought process. What God said is truth. What man thinks up about it can be true and it can be goofy. It can get you kicked out of the Garden of Eden like it did Eve. She got to thinking. She knew what God said. Adam told her what he said. But she changed it a little bit. Just human nature. If you don't keep going back and reading these things, Go back and read them. Read them carefully. Don't add to it or subtract from it. Just find out what's in there and hang in there. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall first, number one, cast out devils. <laughs> they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. What's that talking about? You're not going to, if you're doing what God told you to do, he's got your back. He's your shield. He's your fortress. He's in front of you, around you, behind you, and he's not going to let anybody get to you. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. He will flee. God's got you covered. Well, what if this happens? Don't entertain them, but what ifs. Do what you're told. No fear. The Bible said human beings think it's just healthy to have a little bit of fear. I've heard people say that. You know, a little fear is healthy. No! That's not scriptural. That's not God. It's not Bible. Zero fear is what you're after. Any kind of fear has access to your head. And you can't, it, just because you thought it, and just because it's trying to get you to say it, doesn't mean it's yours. It's not, you are not in fear because you're scared out of your wits. You can be so scared you can't hardly talk. I'd suggest you say Jesus. And what God said don't do is take that fear thought and say that. Because he said, why did you take that thought, saying? If you don't say it, it's not yours. It's in your head. Don't say it. Rebuke it. Amen. Resist it. It'll flee. God told me not to fear, and therefore I will not fear. I will not fear in the name of Jesus. Now, what happened there? You believed in your heart and said with your mouth what God told you is truth. When you believe the truth and say it, you resisted the devil because he can't stand up to truth. That's how you resist him. It's the sword of the Spirit of God, and you said what God said to say, and you swung that sword and you cleared the path. Amen. Now, you did your part. You resisted. God's part, flea button. And he will see to it that whatever's after you flees. Amen. Well, what if it comes back? Then do it again. What if it comes back? Do it again. You won't have to do this very many times because they're getting pound. Every time you do that, they're getting thumped. They're taking a spiritual beating, and I believe it's worse than a physical beating. They won't last very long if you keep pummeling them with your weaponry because your weaponry is supernatural. Theirs is common to man. Yours isn't. You have this word of God, the name of Jesus. It, it, you can say it is written in the name of Jesus, and, and if you just want to put a whammy on it, say, I plead the blood over this whole thing, the blood of Jesus. Amen. devil hates that blood. <laughs> He'd like to get it out of your Bible. He's convinced some scholars that have more 
education than they have revelation. As some of these translations to start, start taking some of the blood out of them. And I'm telling you what, you don't want the blood out of anything. The blood of Jesus is what it cost God Amen. to get you back. The blood of Jesus is what keeps you protected. It's the propitiation for sin. It's the reason why God can treat you like you've never sinned and continue to treat you like you've never sinned and treat you like you've never sinned throughout eternity Amen. because of the blood. The blood did that for you. Most important thing in the Bible to a Christian it's how you've, it's, it's the way into the kingdom. Hallelujah. Okay. They shall take up serpents if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now there's a lot of, lot of word people don't have any problem with that. So they preach the gospel like Jesus said. They go into all the world, they preach the gospel, and they, and they believe in the new birth, and they get people born again, and they lay hands on them when they're sick. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that except you need to do the whole thing, not just parts of it. What's... Why would God say cast out devils first? If the devil, now I'm not saying it is, when, when somebody's sick, we, we live in three realms, spirit, soul, and body. There's three realms that we deal with when we're praying. In the spiritual realm, when you use the name of Jesus, Anything operating in that spirit realm is affected. In the mental realm, it's affected. In the physical realm, it's affected. You can be sick physically, and it, it, it's just a physical thing. I mean, it could be you ate something. Or you got around some uh, chemical of some kind, and it wrecked a part of your health. Or, you, you know, you... Some physical thing happened, broken leg, um, a amputation, something like that. It's just purely physical. Then doctors are really good. Modern medicine is really good at fixing physical, at least getting a person where they can keep on going. It might take a creative miracle to put a leg back on somebody, but they got the leg off of them and, and got them uh, living life and, you know, getting something to work with, and, and they got their life back. That's a good thing. Now, if it's mental, it's a little bit different. There's a lot of things that, that they can't do. Doctors just can't do very much with. In fact, a lot of times what they're doing is giving people some kind of relief. They're not really fixing anything. They're just dulling up a part of their mind that's so sensitive that they're, they're miserable. And it, it's trying to figure out a way to have people have a better life. I mean, they're trying to help, but it's very difficult for science to do very much there. And if it's spiritual, they're not going to get anywhere. There's only one way to get people free when it's a spiritual problem. In the first place is to get the devil out of the deal. Actually, that's a lot of times what's going wrong with them in the mind also. Why would he put cast out devils first? Well, you get the spiritual thing fixed and you get the mental thing fixed and then you go to work on a physical, it'll go pretty good. If, if there wasn't any spiritual or mental thing in the way, the physical will go pretty good. But a lot of times, people are getting treated by doctors and they're not getting any, it's not helping. Why? There's probably more to it than what's, the physical part is the fruit that you can see. But the root cause is probably spiritual or mental or both. You can, you can have something wrong with you that's caused by any three of these realms. You can have something wrong with you that's caused by any two of the three, and you can have something wrong with you that's all three of the three at the same time. 
we're going to read, we're going to get into some and look at some people that were having those issues. There are accounts of them in the Bible, and what Jesus did in the situation is a pattern for us to follow because he said, the things I do, you'll do. Because the one that was in me is in you. He's given us his word. He's given us the the spirit, the anointing. He's given us the authority. He's put us in the earth. He said, now you put him under your feet and keep him there. If he's in people, cast him out. So another thing we want to learn in this study before we get too far into it and, uh, is when you cast out devils, don't just jump in your car and go down the road and forget about the person you cast the devil out of. Because Jesus is real clear in the Bible. They're going to wander around in dry places for a while, and then they're going to come back. And if they find that place swept and clean, he's going back in and he's bringing seven more with him that are worse than he was to begin with. Now there'll be eight of them in there. And the person's going to be way worse off than had you left them alone in the first place. So then pe- people say, and I've got... I got caught doing this before, too. It's like, I don't, know, I don't know how to help this guy because if I cast his devils out, who's to say he's not going to invite him right back in there and be worse off than he is now? Maybe he's better off just being like this. Have you ever thought that before? How would I know the answer to that question? He's right. The, the answer to everything lives on the inside of me. Well, I'll tell you where I won't find out is going up here and trying to figure it out. All you're going to get is confusion. At the least, you'll get confused. At the worst, you'll get oppressed and then depressed. And if you don't watch out, worse than that. Oppression, depression, obsession, possession. It's a slip slide right down into a horrible, horrible place. Where do you stop it? Right off the bat. That's not my thought in the name of Jesus. I won't take it. Hallelujah. And they're just that quick. God said resist him, he'll flee. You know why people get messed up? They don't resist him. They do not follow the directions. They think about it. And God didn't say, think him out of your mind. Well, I can't figure out why it won't go away. Because you won't say anything, duh. Open your mouth. Praise the Lord God Almighty. Pick out a psalm. 23rd Psalm, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear evil, glory be to God, and just read it like that. By the time you get through with that psalm, your mind's going to be going, be right back there thinking about every word you're saying, and if it didn't work, just read it again. Psalm 103, Psalm 112, Psalm 34, there's all kind of psalms, you can just read them, read them out loud and not, not, not uh, idle repetition. Think about what you're reading. Think about what you're saying. Even put it in your own, own words. Make it first person. I, I'm going to take just a minute because this is helping somebody. There's a lot of people watching. We'll be watching this this week before this is over. And uh, this is helping somebody or going to help them right here. Let's try Psalm uh, 112. And, you know, just just show you how to do this. Now, let's do 90. Uh, This is easier. 90. I don't have this Bible marked. Ninety-one. And... uh, 
here's what the Bible says. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord. So instead of reading the narrative and, and everything, read it like this. I dwell in the secret place of the Most High God, and I abide under his shadow, and I say of the Lord, he is my refuge, he is my fortress, it's in God I trust. He will deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He delivers me continually all the time. He covers me with his feathers and under his wings. I trust. His truth is my shield. It is my buckler. And so you see, you go right down through the psalm like that. You make it first person real. Make it alive and say it like you mean it. And, and what will happen is your mind will listen to what you're saying. It has to. You, you, there's no, nothing else can happen. You are wired up by God, though. Your mind is not the boss. Your spirit is. And when your spirit convinced you to read that word, that word coming out of you focuses your mind, and it's locked onto what you're saying. By the time you get through that psalm, whatever it was that was bothering you, has got beat up, got beat up real bad. Amen. And that's good. And if, if the first time you do that, you don't like, you don't think the result was what you expected, do it again and do it again. I'm telling you what, it's working. Whether you think it is or not, whether you feel like it is or not, doesn't really matter. God said it, it's working. And you'll find out it's working when you read that enough times that you get, you get that supernatural release and you'll go, wow, that worked pretty good. I think I'll do that again next time. And the next time you do it, it won't take near as long. You know what you're doing a lot of times is training your body to do what you tell it to do. Shut up, quit whining and get with the program, you're telling your mind to shut up, and it's not used to that, and it doesn't like it. So you got a lot working with there, and then the, there's devils that are filling your mind up with things, trying to get you off track, get you to do something else. And man, they don't want you doing this. But if you get in a habit of doing this, I mean, after a while, there's just certain things just aren't going to bother you anymore because they don't want beat up anymore. There's other people they can mess with. Now you're in a position in the ark to go help people that are getting beat up because they don't know how to do that. You can even do it for them to begin with. They need to learn how to do it themselves, and you need to teach them, but you can get them relief right off the bat. How are they going to cast out a devil? They don't know anything about it. They can't cast him out. You can. But when you cast him out, don't just go jogging down the street and Go to church, give your testimony. I cast out a devil. Well, that's not all there is to it. Keep your eye on that, babe. Make sure, they're, make sure they got something in there when that thing comes back and he, what, it, he doesn't find that swept and cleaned and empty. He finds it swept and cleaned and a word of God in there. He cut, it's like coming in there to rob that house and looking right at the barrel of a 10-gauge, a sawed-off 10-gauge with somebody that's not about to not pull the trigger. Ba-boom. Ha! Amen. Do you see the difference between casting out a devil and casting out a devil and preparing somebody to defend their self when he comes back. They're coming back. God said so. Why don't we ever teach anybody how to defend their self? I know instances where people uh, lined up in revival meetings had got devils cast out of them and didn't even, they didn't even know where to go to church. And the the... the Ministry that got them born again just drove off down the road to the next town, and that they could be states away. 
I know. I used in college. I was in a music group. Man, we got people born again all over this nation. We stopped. We had uh, we had enough music equipment. They asked us to turn down. We did the halftime show at the Cotton Bowl, and they asked us to turn down because we were too loud for the stadium. We could really light up a. Uh, um, shopping mall parking lot and we did in the biggest cities in the nation we'd get permission out on the edge of the uh, parking area and just roll that stuff out on a on the ground and start singing and when we had uh, five trombones five uh, trumpets um, the first electric keyboard customs amp ever made took four men to pack it. It wasn't exactly portable. They called it portable. And uh, enough sound to, that we need to turn it down a football stadium. We'd aim them speakers all the way around that parking lot and just pass the parking area, the shop and mall, and take it right out over the housing additions as far as that sound wanted to go. And we were good. We'd, it was... Uh, it was, we, we, it, we had the top 10 rock and roll songs memorized. We, we, learned, uh, we learned the top 10 every week. If, if something rolled, we learned it. Uh, we had the top 10 uh, country and western. We had the top 10 pop. Um, had uh, Christian music. We could do just about anything in any venue and choreography to go with it, no music. It was a it, it was effective is what I'm trying to, I'm not, sounds like I'm bragging, I'm just trying, what I'm saying is, it worked. We got people flocking in there and the guy that led the group was a, one of the most dynamic evangelists I've ever heard preach. And I mean, as good as anybody you hear on television, as good as Jesse Duplantis, he was good. And I mean, there was, when he got done, there wasn't a dry eye in that place and there were people born again all over it and we jumped in that truck, loaded up and away we went. And we did that day after day after day and city after city after city. And I'm thinking, I wonder what happened to those people. We never hooked them up with a church. We never... Do you suppose that the devil they were serving when they wound up in the right place at the right time and got bored again might have come and made another run at them two or three days when the buzz wore off? How many of you know somebody that got born again and three or four days later they wondered if they were really born again or not? Might have been you. That's just the way this works. That's just, that, that's just the new birth. But suppose you cast somebody, the devil out of somebody. It might not be three or four days. It might take longer than that. But sooner or later, whatever had residence there is going to come back to try again. What if he comes through the door of this guy's house? And what, how, what would that feel like? That, that sinking feeling, that oppression, that depression. Like, I thought, I, here's how it works. I thought I got delivered to that. You did. Well, let's come back. Don't say that. It's trying to come back. Run it off. How do you do that? Well, that's why we're reading Psalm 91. That'd be a good way. Read Psalm 91, first person, Psalm 112, Psalm 23. Just those three alone. By the time you get done with that, that, that would clock that devil in the 70s bringing with him and they'd all be gone. Well, what if they try again in three or four days? Hit them again. Like, this is the way it works. You whip them enough times, they're not coming back. They can only take so much of that. It's, it, is, it, it, it's, it exhausts them. It wears them down, and you defeat them. And you have, you have, they're already defeated. So when you get to pounding on them with the same word that defeated them in the first place, they can only take so much of that, and they don't want, they're not going to want any more. I know Sherry... That, uh, 
Well, I've had her talk about it before this is over, I think, but she had, uh, when we were first married, problems with fear and a spirit of fear. And uh, she got delivered to that. And she learned how when it, it tried to come back, she learned how to run it off. And then it tried in a, just a longer time frame, tried again. And the next time it was a longer time frame, but it did try again. But if you learn how to run them off the first time they come back, the, the more you practice with this, the better you get and the more beat up they get and the, the farther away the deals and, the, and they don't last near as long. Every time that's shorter and shorter until it just goes away. Hallelujah. And here's another good thing about that. If you're learning how to drive that off, that's the same method you use to drive off sickness and disease. If you happen to get a bad doctor's report, it's the same method you use to run off cancer. It'll run off uh, heart disease. It'll run off anything, anything physical, anything mental, anything spiritual. It's all the same process. You find out what it is and you turn loose your weaponry on it, and you drive it out, and when it tries to come back, you defend, your, you defend what God's given you, and you wipe out anything that's trying to lie about it. Take them out. Don't ever make friends with the enemy. Kill them. To hit them with everything you got. Never feel sorry for a devil. They're trying to kill you, just blast them with everything God's given you to blast them with. And if you even think they're wiggling, blast them again. Even if you think they're too completely gone, it's okay to blast them again. It's kind of fun, really. Where do you think Job's force fit? And Job didn't have a covenant like we had. He had a covenant, but it wasn't on the blood of Jesus like we have. But the, devil, the devil's whining about God taking Job's side. And uh, you got that hedge up around him. And God said, behold, or look. That hedge had been gone a long time. And God told Job, not the devil, but he told Job how he, how he got the hedge down. He was worried and worrying out loud about his kids and the, the unbelief knocked down a hedge of protection around his property. But what my point here is, when you start saying the word of God, you build a hedge with the blood covenant of Jesus, the blood of Jesus covenant, that New Testament hedge you build up around your place, your property, your health, your, your whole deal is like... It'd be like trying to break into Fort Knox for the devil. It's not going to work very good, but it will be fun for him to try when you realize what you've got, what you have to, to wipe him out with. Amen. Come on, sucker, give it a try. You know, a lot of Christians, before they get onto this, I think they really think if they just don't antagonize him, maybe he'll leave them alone. And uh, I'm telling you what, that is not the way to handle a devil. You get up in the morning and just pick a fight with him. If he don't come around right off the bat, just go after him. Amen. We are here, number one, preach the gospel and cast out devils. And you might as well start right on your property every morning. In the name of Jesus, any devil listening, I want you to know I'm up and I've got my weapons aimed at you and I'm going to let you have it every chance I get. In Jesus' name, and just start praising God. Hallelujah. Why not? That's what we're here for. Well, I thought I was here to make a living, put together a retirement package and Rest out my golden years. I'm going to spend my golden years clocking devils. Amen. I want when I'm present with the Lord. I want I want to see when I see Jesus. I want to have been beaten something up in the spirit. When I when I drop over when my body drops over and I'm present with the Lord. I want to be in the middle of ripping some devil. Amen. 
Well, can get better than that. And you know what you'd hear? You know what you'd hear the Lord say? Well done, good and faithful servant. Why? Because that's what he told you to do. Well, I just get tired and I need a rest. You need to pray in tongues. A man that prays in an unknown tongue edifies himself. Edified me. You don't need a rest if you're edified. Well, I'm exhausted. Well, you should be praying in tongues. I should be able to tell you're exhausted because you're sitting there praying in tongues. If you've got any spiritual sense and you're exhausted, you'd be praying in tongues. It'll affect you, spirit, and then soul, and then it'll energize your body. I better quit. I haven't got very far, but I really didn't intend to. I want to, I want to go slow enough. There's, there's a, several things that God wants done before we're done with this message. And uh, each one builds on the other one. So it's, it's a process of being... Um, energized, equipped. And I think, you know what, sometimes God's just got to exhort his troops. Kind of like Patton. I never get tired of watching that part of the movie where he's giving a speech to them before they invade and in letting them know we're going to win. Going to be this is going to be a fight, and we're going to win it. Hallelujah. we got to fight, church, and we're going to win it. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for picking us to live in this age, in this 2022 and 2023, and however many of these we have left. I thank you for letting us be a part of it, and I thank you for equipping us to be a a vital part of it for the, the light and the glory and the blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.